Myrna Loy was born on August 2nd, 1905 in Helena, Montana to Idella May and David Franklin Williams. Even as a young girl, little Myrna loved dancing and convinced her parents to enroll her in dancing classes. As Loy once said, by the time I was three years old, I was dancing on my tippy toes. Unsurprisingly, she broke into Hollywood first as a dancer. She was born Myrna Adela Williams. Her parents had married in Helena in 1904, one year before Loy was born. She had one younger brother, David Frederick Williams, who died in 1983. Her paternal grandfather, David Thomas Williams, was Welsh and immigrated from Liverpool, England to the United States in 1856, first arriving in Philadelphia. Fully fluent in Welsh, but unable to read or write in English, he settled in the Montana Territory where he began a career as a rancher. Her maternal grandparents were Scottish and Swedish immigrants. During her childhood, her father worked as a banker, real estate developer, and farmland appraiser in Helena, and was the youngest man ever elected to serve in the Montana State Legislature. Her mother had studied music at the American Conservatory of Music in Chicago, and at one time considered a career as a concert performer, but instead devoted her time to raising Loy and her brother. Her mother was a lifelong Democrat while her father was a Republican. Loy was raised in the Methodist faith. She spent her early life in Raidersburg, Montana, a rural mining community approximately 50 miles southeast of Helena. During the winter of 1912, Loy's mother nearly died from pneumonia and frightened, her father sent his wife and daughter to La Jolla, California. Loy's mother saw commercial potential in Southern California and during one of her husband's visits, she encouraged him to purchase real estate there. Among the properties he bought was land that he would later sell at a considerable profit to filmmaker Charlie Chaplin for his film studio, which was later made into the Henson Puppet Studios. Although her mother tried to persuade her husband to move to California permanently, he preferred Montana life, and the three eventually returned to Montana. Soon after, Loy's mother needed a hysterectomy and insisted Los Angeles was a safer place to have it done, so she, Loy, and Loy's brother David moved to Ocean Park, where Myrna began to take dancing lessons. After the family returned to Montana, Myrna continued her dancing lessons, and at the age of 12, Myrna Williams made her stage debut performing a dance she had choreographed herself based on the Bluebird from the Rose Dream operetta at Helena's Marlowe Theater, which I believe has sadly been deconstructed. When Loy was 13, her father died during the 1918 flu pandemic. Her mother permanently relocated the family to California where they settled in Culver City outside Los Angeles. Loy attended the exclusive Westlake School for Girls while continuing to study dance. When her teachers objected to her extracurricular participation in dance, her mother enrolled her in Venice High School, and at age 15, she began appearing in local stage productions. In 1921, Loy posed for Venice High School sculpture teacher Henry Fielding Weinbrenner as inspiration. The full-length feminine, nearly nude figure was central in his allegorical sculpture group, Fountain of Education. Completed in 1922, the sculpture group was installed in front of the campus outdoor pool in May 1923, where it stood for decades. Loy's slender figure with her uplifted face and one arm extending skyward presented a vision of purity, grace, youthful vigor, and aspiration that was singled out in a Los Angeles Times story, which included a photo of the inspiration figure along with the model's name, the first time her name appeared in a newspaper. A few months later, Loy's inspiration figure was temporarily removed from the sculpture group and transported aboard the Battleship Nevada for a Memorial Day pageant in which Miss Myrna Williams participated. Fountain of Education can also be seen in the opening scenes of the 1978 film Grease. After decades of exposure to the elements and vandalism, the original concrete statue was removed in 2002 and replaced in 2010 by a bronze duplicate paid for through an alumni-led fundraising campaign. Loy left school at the age of 18 to begin to help with the family's finances. Her father had always expected her to help the family, and she obeyed. 
She obtained work at Grauman's Egyptian Theater, where she performed in what were called prologues, elaborate musical sequences that were related to and served as preliminary entertainment before the feature film. During this period, Loy watched Eleonora Dews in the play Thy Will Be Done, and the simple acting techniques she employed made such an impact on Loy that she tried to emulate them throughout her career. None other than infamous heartbreaker Rudolph Valentino helped Loy get her start in Hollywood. When she was still a chorus girl, she got several headshots done that later fell into Valentino's lap. The actor was mesmerized by the start, and he ended up casting her as an extra in the 1925 film Pretty Ladies, which also stars Zazu Pitts, who you can learn about on my channel, and Joan Crawford. Valentino was looking for a leading lady for for Cobra, the first independent project he and his wife Natasha Rambova were producing. Loy tested for the role, which went to Gertrude Olmsted instead, but soon after that she was hired as an extra in Pretty Ladies. Rambova hired Loy for a small but showy role opposite Nita Naldi in What Price Beauty, a film she was producing. Shot in May 1925, the film remained unreleased for three years but stills of Loy in her exotic makeup and costume appeared in Motion Picture Magazine, and this led to a contract with Warner Brothers. Her name was changed as a nod to British poet Mina Loy, perhaps acknowledging Myrna's Welsh heritage. Loy felt responsible for her family's well-being. According to lore, Loy's fam father named her Myrna after he traveled through a town of the same name and found he liked the sound of it. Myrna made many Hollywood friends, and they initially suggested the heavy-handed Myrna Lisa before wisely going with Myrna Loy. One such friend was Joan Crawford. Myrna Loy and Joan Crawford came up together in Hollywood, working together as dancers and extras before they both made it big. You can spot Myrna Loy in some John Barrymore silent films. They would remain lifelong friends. Loy had friends in high places. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was one of her closest confidants. Many of her closest friends called Loy Minnie. Eleanor Roosevelt's husband, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had a very public crush on Loy. She was hands down his favorite actress, and he was deeply disappointed when she visited the White House one day and he couldn't be there. One of the first things he asked upon his return was, well, what was she like? Fellow actress Lauren Bacall even once commented that Roosevelt was tempted to call off the Yalta conference just to meet her, but it never worked out. Instead, the pair wrote letters to each other, indulging in a long-distance infatuation. Loy also volunteered for his 1940 re-election campaign. Loy was no studio puppet, and she frequently made her opinions known. When she first started working for MGM, she had harsh words for their racist casting policies saying, why does every black person in the movies have to play a servant? How about a black person walking up the steps of a courthouse carrying a briefcase, acknowledging the long history of American blacks, including some of their millionaire status prior to this? You can see her treatment of black actors in the Nick and Nora series, which I will be getting to later. Myrna Loy was no fan of her exotic femme fatale daughter character in The Mask of Fu Manchu, and she once expressed her opinion on set. The script called for her character to whip a man with glee, and she refused to do it, protesting, I've done a lot of terrible things in films, but this girl's a sadistic nymphomaniac. When the producer, who apparently hadn't read his Freud, asked what she meant, Loy only tossed out, well, you better find out, because that's what she is. At the height of her fame, a producer told Loy she should visit a plastic surgeon to get her ears fixed. You may notice in many Loy photographs, her ears are covered by her hair. The insecure actress phoned up for a consult under a false name, but she ended up getting much more than she bargained for. When she showed up to the appointment, the surgeon bizarrely took a long series of photos of, photos of her from every angle, even from on top of a chair. Then he announced what he was really doing. Well, he said at last, I've got your nose, Miss Loy. He had immediately recognized the incognito star and used the opportunity to capture and steady her perfect nose one of the most asked for body parts in plastic surgery at the time. Loy never did go back to get her ears fixed. Loy had a long-standing feud with notorious studio head Louis B. Mayer. Mayer didn't believe Loy could play Nora Charles in The Thin Man and almost didn't let her be put in the movie. 
Then when she started feeling restricted by the studio system and asked Mayer for a contract release, he said, you are very ungrateful after all I've done for you, and I couldn't care more about you if you were my own horse. Then he let her go. This spat may have been why Lloyd never received an Academy Award. Despite this, she remained very loyal to Hollywood. Lloyd did receive an honorary award for career achievement in 1991 when she was well into her 80s. The elderly Lloyd accepted the award through a pre-taped spot in her New York home. You've made me very happy, she said. Thank you very much. This was her last public appearance ever. In 1934, notorious gangster John Dillinger was literally public enemy number one. His very existence would be used to justify the creation of the FBI. He had robbed 24 banks and four police stations. Dillinger's mother died when he was three years old, which severely impacted him. He also happened to be a huge Myrna Loy fan, as she had played gangster malls before. On July 22, 1934, police caught wind of the fact that Dillinger had dipped in to see Manhattan melodrama, Loy's most recent flick with Clark Gable and William Powell. Cops surrounded the theater and killed the American legend in a shootout, all because Dillinger just had to see the queen of the movies. In 1932, Lloyd began dating producer Arthur Hornblow Jr. when he was still married to his wife, Juliet Crosby. Prior to this marriage, Lloyd found out she was pregnant and resolved to have an abortion. It was a heart-wrenching choice, but it was about to get even worse. The doctors botched the procedure, which was very common, and rendered her infertile, which is also still common today. She never had any children. It was the infection after the abortion that caused her infertility. Sadly, she really loved children and desperately wanted to adopt, but it never happened throughout her four marriages. Hornblow was the son of Arthur Hornblow Sr., a writer who edited theater magazine in New York City. Hornblow graduated from Dartmouth College and New York Law School and was a member of the fraternity Theta Delta Chi. He served in counterintelligence during World War I and then became a playwright. He was hired as a production supervisor by Sam Goldwyn at Paramount in 1927. Initially, he specialized in popular screwball comedies, eventually giving Billy Wilder his first directing job and producing several films starring Bob Hope. These included The Cat and the Canary and Nothing But the Truth. In 1942, he moved to MGM and transitioned to film noir with Gaslight. In the 1950s, now an independent producer rather than a studio employee, he worked on the musical Oklahoma. He gave aspiring actress Mary Windsor her first screen test and Constance Oakleman her new name, Veronica Lake. This producer's screen credit is distinctive when you see it because it's a reproduction of his signature with an underline, not the printed font. He was the inspiration for the C.S. Forrester character Horatio Hornblower. His first wife, Juliet Crosby, who was born in 1895 and died in 1969, was an American actress and debutante. She is perhaps best remembered for originating the role of Velma Kelly in Chicago in 1926. She was born in Washington, D.C., the daughter of explorer and politician Oscar Terry Crosby and Jean Crosby, granddaughter of a U.S. Senator from Louisiana. Her parents were both from Louisiana. She was presented as a debutante in Washington, D.C., and her older sister married Italian aristocrat Mario Carrillo. During World War I, she served as a Red Cross nurse. Her Broadway credits included roles in Martinique, The Love Child, The Show Off, Nirvana, Chicago, and Charlie's Aunt. She appeared in two films, Paris Bound and Charming Sinners, both in 1929. She also worked with Walter Houston of the Houston acting family. She was considered stylish and her dresses were photographed and described in detail in newspapers. Together with Arthur Hornblow Jr., who she married in 1923, they had a son, John Terry Hornblow. They divorced in 1936, a month before Hornblow married Myrna Loy. Supposedly, Loy had an on-off affair with Spencer Tracy her whole life. As a result, she hated Katherine Hepburn. She was shrill and awful all the time, Loy said in a radio interview. I couldn't stand her. 
It seems Loy had no use for Hepburn. Loy admitted Tracy was the love of her life. One could only think about Tracy's poor, long-suffering wife through all of this. In June of 1942, the cracks in Loy's relationship with Hornblow came to a bitter end. She divorced him, citing mental cruelty as the grounds for the split. It's not known if this is related to her abortion, which may have been Hornblow's. She later convinced that Hornblow was one of the loves of her life, but also added, of course, he just about wrecked my life too. Just five days after her divorce from Hornblow, Loy married advertising executive John D. Hertz Jr., the very rich founder of Hertz Rent-A-Car. Sadly, Hertz seemed insecure by Loy, and he was mentally and physically abusive to her during their two-year marriage. One day, he hit her so hard, he gave her a black eye. The difference in religion may have played a role, with Loy still a Methodist at the time and Hertz Jewish. They divorced in Mexico in August 1944, with Loy again citing mental cruelty. One of Loy's trademarks was her pert, upturned nose. Film critics called it a wonder of nature and a plastic surgeon's paragon. In the 1930s, scores of young women begged their doctors to give them Loy's profile. A New York Times reporter wrote in November 1987 that during the many years Myrna Loy reigned as one of America's leading movie stars, millions of fans idolized her as the perfect wife, a paragon of charm, sophistication, and intelligence, whose sly sense of humor never deserted her no matter how outrageous the circumstances or her husband's behavior. Men went mad for Loy's good looks and proper charms, and one of her many nicknames was the perfect wife. Old Hollywood superstar Jimmy Stewart, who starred with Loy in the Thin Man films, said there ought to be a law against any man who doesn't marry Myrna Loy. He wasn't the only fan. The frenzied American public also formed Men Must Marry Myrna Clubs. During the World War II years, she received more than 50,000 letters from servicemen overseas proposing marriage. Each one declared he knew I'd make him a perfect wife. It nearly drove me crazy, she said. The actress gained lasting fame for her role as the intrepid and hard-drinking heiress Nora Charles in The Thin Man and its many sequels based on novels by Delcia Hammett. She and William Powell played a husband and wife detective duo in the film and their natural boozy chemistry made them frequent collaborators from then on. The set of the first Thin Man was a very loose affair, with director W.S. Van Dyke often wrapping scenes up in one take and moving on to the next. Filming the entire movie took only 18 days. One day, it all unraveled. There was a complicated dinner scene requiring rare retakes, so no one saw the problem with a plate of oysters that had to be brought out again and again under the hot stage lights. As Loy recalled, they began to putrefy. By the end we finished that scene, nobody ever wanted to see another oyster. In order for Loy to obtain her iconic part as Nora Charles, the director put her through a manipulative test. One day, while they were both at a Hollywood party, maybe William Powell's house with his infamous swimming pool, he pushed her in the pool just to see her reaction. When she responded with aplomb and happiness, he knew he had found his fun-loving Nora. By the time Loy found success in The Thin Man, she had been rising and grinding for quite some time. As she put it, that finally made me, after more than 80 films. Loy might not have had much success with her four real-life marriages, but she frequently played happy wives on screen. She and William Powell, who you can learn about more on my channel, played husband and wife no less than 13 times, leading him to quip, even my best friends never fail to tell me that the smartest thing I ever did was to marry Myrna Loy on screen. In 1936, the public voted Myrna Loy the queen of the movies, alongside Clark Gable's king of the movies. Loy's victory came with a tin and velvet crown. She frequently collaborated with Gable on films, and the macho actor shared a little-known vulnerable side with her. They had an absolutely disastrous start. Loy always found him arrogant and narcissistic, but one day he really outdid his, himself. He stood at her door and made a move on her, all while his wife was waiting in the car. As Loy recalled, I pushed him off the porch. Imagine a grown man acting like that. 
As she revealed in her memoirs, they would read Shakespeare and other poetry together late into the night after filming was done. According to Loy, he loved poetry and read beautifully with great sensitivity, but he wouldn't dare let anyone else know it. During this period, Loy was one of Hollywood's busiest and highest paid actresses, and in 1937 and 1938, she was listed in the annual Quigley Poll of the top 10 money-making stars, which was compiled from the votes of movie exhibitors throughout the United States for the stars who had generated the most revenue in their theaters over the previous year. According to Loy, the only two actors who never tried to sleep with her were Cary Grant and William Powell. Though she was known for playing exotic and dark roles, Myrna Loy was actual and natural redhead. Her history of playing vamps and femme fatales, in contrast to her professional demeanor, led director John Ford to comment, wouldn't you know, the kid they play to, they pick the, to play the tramps is the only good girl in Hollywood. The only good girl would be the name of her biography years later. Though Loy had many affairs with actors, she never married a thespian. As her biographer once quipped, you see, Myrna likes brains. That's not a notable trait in actors. When World War II broke out in Europe, Loy was one of the fiercest critics of the Germans. She was so loud about her moral objections that she got blacklisted in Germany, with its government banning her films. This endeared her to Hollywood, which was very anti-German, and had been since they lost many key leading actors and actresses to the more experimental transcendental German films of the 1920s and 1930s. During the 1930s, studio heads discouraged public political activity by their stars, arguing that it would alienate a large portion of the movie audience they depended on for revenue. When she was a reigning star at MGM in the 1930s, Loy lent her name anyway to the campaigns of Roosevelt. This did not help her relations with the studio boss, Mayer, whose personal hero was Herbert Hoover. She and Mayer had repeated battles. Loy would develop one of her most cherished, cherished friendships with Czech leader Masaryk, who visited New York often during and after World War II to stir up support. Think about Zelensky today. In his final broadcast, Masaryk said, Myrna Loy, whose words of encouragement in the darkest hour of my life and the history of my nation helped to give me courage during the seven long years that followed. Loy helped run a naval auxiliary canteen and toured frequently to raise funds for the war efforts, including to hospitals. She returned to New York City and resumed her Red Cross work. She wrote, it seemed essential as the war wound down to make sure that the entertainment and hospital tours, the morale lifting would continue when the band stopped playing, acknowledging the impacts of PTSD on soldiers then, which we don't really have today. I mean, as a effort to reduce PTSD. Around 1945, Loy began dating producer and screenwriter Jean Markey, a screenwriter and formerly trained sketch artist who had previously been married to actresses Joan Bennett and Haida Lamar. During the spring of 1945, according to the United States National Archives, Loy became interested in the United Nations. From the moment of its founding in the spring of 1945, Myrna took up the mission of the United Nations as her own crusade. She visited the Lake Success temporary headquarters for the United Nations before its move to New York. Moved by the visit, she later wrote, I still recall the impact of the proud circle of international flags flying outside those temporary headquarters. A vague concept of world peace had engaged me since my childhood support of Wilson's League of Nations. First-hand exposure to the wags of war in burn centers and psychiatric wards intensified it. The founding of the United Nations in 1945 gave it direction, a sense of commitment that my picture career had never inspired. She spoke at and was associated with various communist groups during this time, including the American Slav Congress. In September 1947, the House Un-American Activities Committee decided to hold hearings to expose and root out communists from positions of power, and particularly those in the entertainment industry, which had entertained communists such as Lenin for years. The committee subpoenaed 43 prominent Hollywood figures and demanded that they testify before the committee. 
In response, a committee for the First Amendment, a group hurriedly organized by Philip Dunn, Loy, and film directors John Huston and William Wyler, protested these attempts to curb political freedom and set arbitrary standards of Americanism. The organization described itself as a non-political organization campaigning only for honesty, fairness, and the accepted rights of any American citizen. Loy contributed $1,000 to the committee and attended the founders' meeting in the living room of Ira Gershwin. Jean Markey and Myrna Loy were married in a private ceremony in 1946 at the chapel on Terminal Island while Markey was serving in the military. He was a producer of the 1937 Shirley Temple film, Wee Willie Winkie, among others. He was a very skilled conversationalist, and he quickly became a popular fixture in Hollywood society. Among his good friends in Hollywood were producer John Hay Whitney, composer Irving Berlin, actors Douglas Fair Fairbanks Jr., and John Wayne. He would often go fishing with Wayne off Catalina Island, California. A 1946 article in the Washington Times Herald said, other men say, what's Gene Markey got that we haven't got? The article ran a photo of Rudolph Valentino with the caption, not so hot by comparison. Though all American womanhood swooned over him in his day, Rudolph Valentino was no Markey. Markey became the most sought after unattached man in the cinema firmament, so sprinkled with far handsomer, richer male stars in 1929. He was married three times to prominent film actresses to Myrna Loy from 1946 to 1950. At first, in divorce proceedings, Loy claimed mental cruelty, but later retracted it, saying he could make a scrub woman think she was a queen, and he could make a queen think she was the queen of queens. He insisted on being called Admiral Markey, never Mr. Markey, and rarely Jean. The rest of his life, he would toss any mail, including bills, that wasn't addressed to Admiral Markey into the trash. He was a noted party giver. One of his specialties was a tropical punch made with an unknown number of rums. At his parties, his old friends from Hollywood often mixed with his new friends from Kentucky. While he lived in Kentucky, he purchased an 18th century log cabin and had it moved to the Calumet Farm property, where he would use it as his writing room. He had two brands of private reserve bourbon distilled that he named Old Commodore as a tribute to his service in the United States Navy and Old Calumet Cabin after his writing room. He was commissioned a Kentucky colonel in 1958 due to his love and devotion to Kentucky, expressed not only in his novels but also in horse breeding and racing. He also served as the model for the character played by Burgess Meredith in the 1965 film In Harm's Way, starring his good friend John Wayne. Myrna returned to films with The Thin Man Goes Home in 1945 and playing the wife of a returning serviceman, a role she knew well, in The Best Years of Our Lives from 1946. She was paired with Cary Grant in 1947, where the film The Bachelor and the Bobby Soxer co-starred a teenage Shirley Temple. Her fourth and final husband was Howland H. Sargent, United States Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs and president of Radio Liberty, which was the America propaganda channel for international radio. She married Sargent in 1951 in Fort Myer, Virginia. Sargent was a Presbyterian and wanted the marriage officiated in the church, but they were unable to do so due to Loy's recent divorce from Markey. The American Committee for the Liberation of the Peoples of Russia founded Radio Liberty and it had a propaganda message in 1904, and Sargent became its first president. He held this position until 1975. Radio Liberty merged with Radio Free Europe in 1976. Throughout the 1950s, Loy assumed an influential role as co-chairman of the Advisory Council of the National Committee Against Discrimination in Housing. This committee fought against freedom of association and forced housing mixes in inner cities. In 1948, she became a member of the United States National Commission for UNESCO, the first Hollywood celebrity to do so. After divorcing her fourth husband, Sargent, in 1960, she relocated to Manhattan's Upper East Side at 23 East 74th Street. She later lived at 425 East 63rd Street. In later years, she kept a sad secret. In 1975, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and had to undergo two mastectomies to combat the illness. 
She kept it hush-hush from the public and only revealed the extent of her battle in her 1987 autobiography, Myrna Loy, Being and Becoming. She died in 1993 from an undisclosed illness, and her ashes were scattered in her hometown of Helena, Montana. A building at Sony Picture Studios, formerly MGM, in Culver City is named in her honor. Steel Pole Bathtub has a song on their 1991 album Tulip that is named after Loy and samples dialogue from one of her films. In 1991, the Myrna Loy Center for the Performing and Media Arts opened in downtown Helena, not far from Loy's childhood home. Located in the historic Lewis and Clark Country Jail, it sponsors live performances and alternative films. Myrna Loy is interesting because we really see her undertake political action based on who she was married with or socializing with at the time. I think her reliance on the men in her life and then her transcendence beyond them for her political feeling is really rooted in the early loss of her father and how close she was to her father. But what do you think?